Well, we've reviewed every single show in 10 minutes. We've gone through the year broken down by numbers and given some awards to some of my favorites. Now it's time for a ranking. Do you think anyone's going to notice that I'm wearing the same outfit for all three videos? I mean, can you blame me? This is gorgeous. Hold on. I mean, I mean, can you blame me? Can you blame me? This is adorable. This is amazing. Today, we are going to be going through the top 20 shows of 2023. But if you haven't seen my face before, hi, I'm Ellie. I talk about theatre. I am the most chaotic theatre person on the internet. I do reviews, I do discussions, I do video essays. And if any of that sounds interesting to you, please consider hitting like and subscribe. It really helps me out, helps out the channel. But let's go into the very best of 2023. I'm going to be talking about 20 different shows that I saw in 2023. For the sake of not repeating myself in previous years, anything that I saw in a previous year is not going to be on this list, even though I saw it again. Otherwise, every single year, the top place would be come from away, and that wouldn't be very good for anyone. Now, I was actually going to count shows that I had seen in 2023 for the first time, but had already previously opened and have been open for a while. However, when I actually came to making my list of 20, there was only one. So just for the sake of ease, I've just taken that one show and it's going to be an honorable mention. I'm going to slot it into the listing where it would have placed. Uh, so essentially you're getting one extra for free. You're getting one extra show. You're getting 21 shows. It's like I just gave you a box of 20 chicken nuggets and you got an extra one. You don't complain when that happens, so don't complain now. <laughs> but with all that said, these are the top 20 shows of 2023. Number 20, Patriots. This play tackles a piece of very modern history and it is thrilling, it's engaging, and pitches a very interesting question. How much patriotism can you hold when your country hates you? Well, no wonder this show made the top 20. That's very relatable right now. <laughs> this play dives into some really interesting debates while exploring this piece of modern history. I think the show is definitely carried by some phenomenal performances. The one I'll mention here is definitely Will Keen as Vladimir Putin, who just brings you on this journey, starting off with no power as he starts to rise to it and becomes a lot more sinister. His performance in this show is glorious. With some brilliant direction from Rupert Gold, this play really dives in to these questions of what it means to be a patriot. Number 19, The Carjet Falls. The last production to be overseen by artistic director Tim Shearer for the Regent's Park Open Air Theatre, this was an absolutely flashy and glamorous way for this director's time to end at the Regent's Park. I think what really saw this production was a lot of its staging and its costumes, especially the final sequence in the club. You just see all of these lights shining bright, which especially after the sun has set over the open air theater, just look absolutely stunning. But what's more, I think it's some of these performances, namely Carl Mullaney as Alban, that just bring this show to life, especially in the show-stopping Act 1 finale number, I Am What I Am. This song is a queer anthem for a reason, and Mullaney's performance of it just breathes in everything you need. The pain, the anguish of being left behind, but also the statement of I am not going to change anyone. Number 18, Peter Pan Goes Wrong. This is probably my favorite mischief show of all time. And that's a lot because I love mischief a lot. I adore mischief. I think their brand of comedy just works so well. They are so smart as creatives and I love how they are never okay with just doing slapstick. Every single show that they do, they bring it up and up and up and they try new things as a company. And I think Peter Pan Goes Wrong is a great example of this. They could have just done everything that they did in the play that goes wrong again, but just with a different lick of paint. But instead, they use the formula to really dive into the characters that they've created and give them further backstory while this chaotic pantomime is falling apart. 
it's so much fun. It's so funny. And you really, really do fall in love with the characters in this show. I think it's really telling that when it came to adapt one of the Goes Wrong shows to TV, this is the one that they picked. Number 17. Babies. There was there was no program. This was a concert. There was there was there. Uh, they uh, there you go. <laughs> when a work in progress production is managing to sneak into your top twenty shows of the year, that's saying something. Babies already has so much potential, it's already ready to move on to where it needs to go. This story of a group of year 11 students who are tasked to look after plastic baby simulator dolls is so funny, so perfectly captures the voice of 16 year olds today, and just presents it with some of the best music I've heard in a new musical in a long time time. This is a musical that we need to get excited for, because if it is this well put together, if it's this fresh and interesting on a pretty blank stage, imagine what it can do with a full production. If you want to have a great time tonight, go and listen to some of the demos from Babies, like Baby Baby Baby. That's a perfect example of, of a, a, an amazing opening number that just perfectly sets up the show. There is so much about Babies that just makes it work. It has that perfect charm that I love in a lot of new British musicals. I cannot wait to see this show come back because it needs a full run yesterday. Number 16. Happy Mill. This is what trans joy looks like. I say a lot that I want to see more trans theatre. I do. I really want to. There is nothing more joyful than seeing yourself on stage and seeing characters that you can relate to in that way. But a lot of the time, trans stories like to focus on the sad part, the trauma. There is so much to love about being trans. There's so much that it opens yourself up to. Just being able to finally see yourself is so powerful. And that's why I feel like I, I gravitate a lot more to trans joy stories than I do trans tragedies. And I think Happy Meal this year was one of the standout productions for trans joy. This story it's really simple. Just two trans people meeting each other over the internet, over chat rooms and Club Penguin, and discovering each other as they discover themselves. It's so beautiful. It's so humanly written. It's just a really satisfying production that just leaves you with a massive smile on your face. It's lovely. It's so, so lovely. And I do hope it comes back soon. Number 15. The Little Big Things. If we're talking about musicals that have grown on me a lot, The Little Big Things is probably up there. The first time I watched it, I really did enjoy it. But then when I went back without a critic's hat on, I really did fall in love with the way that they've explored this material and retold this story on stage. When Henry was 17, he went through an accident that left him disabled. And this musical explores his journey of acceptance of this and how he readjusts to life in a wheelchair. As I said with like trans stories, how they often focus on tragedy, a lot of disabled stories have a similar thing where they're like only focus on like the aspirational element and and sometimes disabled stories can feel a bit like a pity party. And the little bit of things really tries to avoid this narrative and in return delivers such a beautiful story about coming to terms with a big change and embracing it. It dives into Henry's family members and the effect that this has on them, but it's mostly about Henry. It's mostly about him. And using the analogy of always looking back on your past self, it really tells this story of letting go of the past and embracing the future with a really lovely score full of some really great songs. Even though I feel like it's missing the one song that would just bring it to a five star rating, this show is an absolute treat. It's a joy to watch. It's so lovely and heartwarming and it's well, well worth a watch. Number 14, Two Strangers Carry a Cake Across New York. I love a two-person musical. I really do love a two-person musical. And this is no exception. This is one of the most charming shows 
I have seen this year. From Sam Tutty's portrayal as Dougal, this wide-eyed tourist, and the much more down-to-earth Robin, these two play off each other so well, and we get this lovely little meet-cute musical as Dougal prepares to go to his father's wedding. His father, who could not care less about him. It's so sweet. It's just like a lovely little experience. It tells this quite small contained story in a really fun and engaging way. And with some really funny moments, some music that really, really does shine. And I want a cast album. I want a cast album right now, please. This show really delivers on a lovely little experience. That's how we're going to describe it. Yes, I didn't actually review this one. So I guess that's your review. <laughs> it was lovely. <laughs> Number 13, The Secret Life of Bees. This almost was on my list for the most underrated show of the year. This production at the Yamida didn't really gain that much fanfare. And I think it's such a shame because this musical is really, really good. With the help of Rosaline, Lily escapes her abusive father and goes to try and find her mother. And this journey leads them to being taken in by a group of black women. This is very much a found family musical. And I love that. I love a good found family story. And the way that this kind of group forms, how they all look after each other is so wonderful to watch. I love how this story is told through musical theatre. This score is fantastic, written by Duncan Sheik, who you may recognise from his work on Spring Awakening, with lyrics by Susan Birkenhead. Again, this is another musical. Give me a cast album. Give me a cast album, please. I miss some of this music. The, the actual like orchestrations, there's a lot of moments in there that do feel very Spring Awakening. So if you do like Duncan Sheik's work, you would absolutely adore the music in this. It's a shame there's no cast album because they haven't recorded one yet. And I'm mad about that. <laughs> it's a really beautiful show, really human diving so strongly into these characters. I really hope it gets some kind of life beyond the Almeida run, because this is one that deserves to be a lot more recognised. Number 12, Dear England. I did not expect Dear England, the play all about football, to be anywhere near my top 20 shows of the year. But I think that is just a massive testament to how strong James Graham's writing is. This is not even the only James Graham play on this top 20 list. <laughs> This play goes through Gareth Southgate's tenure as England manager. It asks the question, why does England keep on losing? And how much does mental health impact players' abilities to perform in the World Cup? What this play does really successfully is it takes this topic, this topic I would have absolutely no interest in, and really focuses on the people behind it by diving into the mental health side of things, by diving into these really intriguing discussions about football and what it means and why people love it so much and why people are so engaged and how much pressure that puts onto these very young players who suddenly have the world's eyes on them. That is a lot to deal with, and this play explores this so well. It's only got like a week left in the West End, but I would highly recommend it, whether you are a massive fan of football or not. Number 11, Crazy For You. I mean, who could ask for anything more? <laughs> I think Crazy For You just sells itself on its choreography. This is some of the best choreography I have ever seen. Just absolutely stunning. It takes the amazing Gershwin music and blends it all into this musical about Charlie Stemp's character, Bobby, who dreams of being on a Broadway stage. But instead, he's working for a bank. But when he's sent to a small town and discovers an old abandoned theatre, he is determined to save it by putting on one last show. It is a musical with so much showbiz. It's like one of the most perfect classic musicals ever, which is funny to say because all of the classic musicals I end up really liking are not actually classic musicals. This was written in the 80s. Like, <laughs> and I'm always like, yep, yeah, okay, not that one. 42nd Street. I like that one. Yep. Also, also not written in the time period it's set in. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just written to be like those musicals, but it's not. <laughs> but what is authentic to the time period is this incredible Gershwin score that just absolutely soars on this giant Gillian Lynn stage with this slick, stunning choreography. This is one that is absolutely beautiful, and it's such a shame that it closed slightly early, so I can't tell you to go and see it in its final week. We're now at our top 10, or top 11, because we still haven't given our honorable mention yet. So number 10, Sylvia. This musical retells the story of the suffragette movement, through the lens of the Pankhurst family. And it tells the conflict of two of the members of this family, Sylvia Pankhurst and Emmeline Pankhurst. It explores their different ideals with the suffragette movement, the places where they stand together and the places where they stood apart, all matched to this rap score, which gives it massive Hamilton vibes. But this show has something about it. There are so many times and places where people are like, this is going to be the next Hamilton. This is the next, this is the British Hamilton. The only time where I've gone like, yeah, I can see what you're talking about is Sylvia. Sylvia does actually feel like the British Hamilton. Honestly, if you want to have a good time, go and listen to the one song they've released from this show, March Women March. Every time I listen to that song, I am put straight back into that theatre, experiencing the show for the first time. Honestly, I think all this show needs to do is just cut down, trim off a little bit of act one, and then I think it could be a show of the year. This is an amazing show with such a strong score, with amazing performances from Sharon Rose and Beverly Knight, as the two previously mentioned Pankhurst. This is a show that I need back now, please and thank you. I would love it back, thank you. It's one that was very underrated and I want it back, please. Please, I would really enjoy that, thank you. Number nine, Stephen Sondheim's Old Friends. As a fairly casual fan of Sondheim, I think there was something really beautiful about Old Friends. This beautiful celebration of this absolute icon of musical theatre's work just completely sells itself. This review show picks the very, very best of Sondheim, doing big mashup numbers performed by some of the most talented musical theatre performers of all time. We have Leia Salonga here, making me wish that she could play every single character that she gives us a tiny snippet of, like her Mama Rose, like her Mrs. Lovett. We have Bernadette Peters, absolute legend performing her heart out. We have absolute stars like Bonnie Langford, Janie D, Claire Burt, Damien Hubley just selling all of this wonderful material, giving new lenses and new ideas to this material and proving why Sondheim's work will live on forever. This is where the honourable mention is placed. This is where I feel like this show would be in the ranking if it counted. It should count. I'm not really counting it. It's Matilda. I already loved Matilda before I went to see it on stage. I was obsessed with the cast album. I love the film. I really have seen Matilda before, but I've never actually seen it live on stage. You can, you can put two and two together how I've seen Matilda the musical. But finally being able to witness this show live just proves why I love it so much. It has some of the greatest music and most genius lyrics ever written. It is a beautiful, beautiful musical that retells the classic Rodeo story perfectly. I mean, honestly, it could probably even be higher. I think when you're talking about musicals aimed for families and younger audiences, this stands out as one of the strongest adaptations ever. And there is a reason this show has lasted in the West End for 13 years. And I'm mad that it took me 13 years to see it. <laughs> but to be fair, they only made the 16 to 25 10 pound tickets available online this year, so only this year I could afford to see Matilda. <laughs> Number eight, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. As I said in my awards video, in my year in review video, if there was any show this year that I would want back immediately, if you gave me a West End theatre and said put a show into it that has closed this year, 
it would be this one. I think there is something so beautiful about this new version of the classic story of Benjamin Button, the man who ages backwards. This musical tells a doomed to fail love story. From the way that this show sets it up, you know that nothing is going to end well. You know what's going to happen. It's inevitable. There is nothing that is going to change what is going to happen to Benjamin Button. And yet every part of you just begs that somehow these two can end up happy, that these two can live together happily ever after, but it's not going to work like that. It's never going to work like that. And matched with a beautiful folk score reminiscent of Amelie, this show just completely tears your heart out. It is glorious. And even though the story of Benjamin Button ends with pain, I would watch it again and again and again. Number seven, A Strange Loop. This program is too big. This program is way too big. I'm gonna hold it like this. Another one that I didn't actually manage to review this year. A Strange Loop starts off, you know, it's, it's nice, it's normal, it's a queer story, it's gonna be big and bold, and then it just just changes on a dime, and now I need therapy. <laughs> as Usher in the musical himself describes the musical as, A Strange Loop is a musical about a black man who's writing a musical about a black man who's writing a musical about a black man who's writing a musical. As he's surrounded by his extremely obnoxious thoughts. This musical does not skip out on any of the brutality of the black queer experience in America. We get some very, very uncomfortable truths and very, very uncomfortable scenes. And I think that's what makes this show really important. This semi-autobiographical story is so truthful in its portrayal, so honest, with some incredible music that I feel like I, I, I even underrate. I need to go back and listen to the cast album again. This is a show that I would really love to see. I, I think they did. I would really love to see a pro shot of this. I think I think that it did film at the Barbican, but I don't want I I can't confirm nor deny that. <laughs> but either way, one of the most powerful musicals I've seen in a long time. Number six, Groundhog Day. I fell in love with Groundhog Day the second it went to Broadway. I was so mad because I found out the Groundhog Day musical was on like the week of closing, so I couldn't see it when it was first over here. So you know the second it went to Broadway, I was listening to that cast album and I just fell in love. Look, you I've already ranted for ages about why I love Matilda, and I feel like Tim Minchin is two for two when it comes to his musicals. He understands how to adapt something and make it feel like its own version of it while not skimping out on anything that makes the original story what it is. The Groundhog Day musical, yes, feels very similar in places to the film, but what it adapts, what it changes, how it molds itself to work with this repeating story on stage is what really makes it shine. It manages to take a very, very unlikable protagonist and just show you how he changes and how he grows, which is very funny to think that every single year, this same theatre, the Old Vic, <laughs> does a Christmas Carol, which I feel like you can argue that <laughs> Groundhog Day has a similar vibe with protagonist as a Christmas Carol. <laughs> Andy Carl is phenomenal as Phil. It's so good to see Tanisha Spring get a chance to shine, and we all know that she is going to go on to do amazing things, and I cannot wait to see her in Moulin Rouge. This show is amazing, and I adore it. Please give it a UK tour. Thank you. Number six, Groundhog Day. No, no, don't worry, I'm not going to do that joke. <laughs> Number five, Sunset Boulevard. I left my program on the floor for this one, so please enjoy my artist rendition of Nicole Swerdinger. There you go. <laughs> I say this a lot, and I will say it again. I would rather see a revival take a massive swing and completely miss, than see something safe. I don't always want to see the same production of a musical. I want to see musical theatre be able to grow and grow and constantly change and adapt itself. So whenever I see people moaning about a revival that completely changes everything, I completely ignore them because I'm like, 
yeah, that's exactly what you want a revival to do. Even if it's not the production you fell in love with, that production still exists. This is not, this is going to be a one and done thing. You're never going to see someone do Sunset Boulevard like this again. And that's why despite having problems with Oklahoma, I rate it a lot higher than a lot of other shows. Honestly, it was really close to being in the top 20 this year. Because for its flaws, it takes big swings. And you know what? The things that hit about Oklahoma really, really do work. But if Oklahoma had things that missed for me, Sunset Boulevard does not. Sunset Boulevard hits a home run with every single big swing it takes. From the decision to strip everything back from the camera work, it is an absolute treat to watch. It's very natural for this story. It feels completely, utterly earned for this story to be told with a lot of screen and a lot of film cameras on stage and projection. It's all about a movie star. It's all about, literally, the most iconic line from this musical is, I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. I'm sorry, you cannot tell me that making it done, filmed a lot of the time, does not work. <laughs> I feel like this show could be higher if I liked Sunset Boulevard a bit more. I feel like it has some incredible moments, but a lot of the music can feel a little bit repetitive at times. But I think that's the power of a really interesting production. A show that I feel like in any other circumstance I wouldn't be that enthralled by manages to climb its way to the top of this list with some incredible performances, namely Nicole Swerzinger, who I feel like has already snuck that Olivier into her purse. She gives it her all on that stage, delivering a really interesting and different Norma Desmond to what we're used to. This is one I wish I could see again. And yes, part of this ranking goes to the start of Act 2. Brilliant. Brilliant. I love to see really bold ideas done on stage and just work as well and as slickly as that one. Number four, Best of Enemies. Here you go, another James Graham play on this list. James Graham's play that explores the true story of this political moment in modern history. It's the 60s, America, and ABC has decided to cover the primaries for the upcoming election by pitting a well-known Republican with a well-known Democrat. This piece of modern history has such a massive impact on how we view politics, on how we explore things. And really, we still see a lot of the repercussions of how the political debates was changed by this. David Harwood and Zachary Quinto are just on fire in this show. Their performances are thrilling to watch. It is an engaging play that explores this topic thoroughly, incredibly, every single positive word that I can give to it. This was my first show of the year, and I started the year on a very, very good note. Number three, Next to Normal. I have been waiting for a bit. I feel like I'm holding up an award, <laughs> and the award goes to Next to Normal. <laughs> That's the thing with the Don Mar Warehouse programs, you just feel like you're holding up a sign. <laughs> I waited for years for a production of Next to Normal. And this year, I got the one we deserved. If we had to wait for years and years and years to get a version of Next to Normal, I'm glad that we got this one because it feels like they landed on the perfect cast. It feels like they landed on the perfect venue and it feels like they landed on the perfect opportunity to breathe new life into this musical. This tells a story of Diane a woman who suffers with a bipolar disorder, and it explores the effects of this on herself and on her family around her. With an absolutely rocking score of some of the greatest music theater songs to ever be written, like I'm Alive, I Miss the Mountains, and more and more and more, this show just shines. Honestly, as I speak about it, I feel like it should probably be higher on this list, and I may move it higher on this list. So if it feels higher on this list, it's probably because I moved it up. <laughs> yeah, this show was originally fourth. Uh, <laughs> I've moved it up, as you can probably tell. <laughs> Casey Levy as Diana 
is an absolute godsend. She dives into so many of the complexities of this character. We get a absolutely jaw-dropping performance from that's going to Gabe Wolf, but no, that's his character. But yeah, an absolutely jaw-dropping performance from Jack Wolf as Gabe. We get so many amazing performances. Edna Worthington Cox, who I, she's already been in Secret Life of Bees and then was in Next to Normal. She's two for two in Amazing Musicals this year. She was also in Matilda as a kid. So I guess she's got three on this list. <laughs> Jamie Parker, another one. He was in Benjamin Button and then ripped my heart out in this as well. Jesus Christ, man. Honestly, when this show transfers to the Wyndhams, if we don't see most of these cast members stay, I'm going to be very upset because this cast just made this show. Really diving into all of the complexities of their characters, delivering a really human musical with one of my favorite scores of all time. Number two, for black boys who have considered suicide when the hue gets too heavy. On the surface, for black boys is a simple show. It's about six black men in group therapy. You can say the concept on the tin, but when you actually watch the show, when you dive into it and you start to see these topics unwrap, these stories from these different men start to be developed and you see six black men open themselves up and really bond as a group, it suddenly becomes one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen on stage. It is glorious to watch. It's tough. It's a tough watch. There is a lot in here that really dives in. Similar to things I said about um, Stranger Loop, it really dives in to the Black experience. And I feel like as someone who is white, it is important to watch these pieces of theatre, get these perspectives that I am unaware of, because that's how you learn. Theatre is a great tool for empathy, to really put yourself into another person's shoes. And being there on that press night for black boys, you can see how that audience reacted. You can see how much it meant for people in that audience to be hearing that story, to see themselves on stage. And even as someone who doesn't necessarily share this perspective and this experience, it still was so touching, so moving, so vitally important, and so beautiful to see a group of men talk about their mental health on stage and end it all by coming together. It is a stunning show, and when it comes back to the West End next year, you need to go and see it. And here we are. The top of the list. Congratulations, you made it this far. This is a long video. I didn't think I'd be recording for this long, otherwise I would have got a bigger drink. <laughs> but number one, my favorite show this year, it was tough, but I've given it to Operation Mincemeat. I think Operation Mincemeat has quickly become my new comfort show. Previously it was Come From Away, but you know, that sadly closed and I have been looking for something to fill that gap. And I feel like Operation Mincemeat has done that. This campy five person comedy show with massive uh, classic British comedy vibes surrounds the story of Operation Mincemeat, a true operation held during World War II, where we decided that the way to trick the Germans was to use a dead body and fake ID. And you know what? It worked. This show is bonkers. It is off the wall. It is chaos. And there's so much joy in that. There is so much joy. You really do fall in love with all of these over-the-top characters. You really do get a sense of who they are. Their journeys matched alongside some of the funniest comedy in theatre at the moment. And some of the best songs I've heard in a long time. But for all of its comedy and silliness, it really does make you feel for these characters, which is summated in songs like Dear Bill that flip the switch and just bring you into this one moment. This show knows when to take a pause. It knows when exactly to slow it down. It packs in a laugh a minute, but also manages to make you fall in love with these people. It is a joy. It's so easily rewatchable. It is the little show that could make it to the top of my top 20 list for shows this year.
But that's it. Those are my top 20-ish shows of 2023. What's been your favourites this year? I mean, you don't you don't need to share 20. You can share five. I don't know. Let me know your favourites in the comments down below. If you did enjoy this video, please consider hitting like and subscribe. It really helps me. It helps the channel. Here's some links to some of my videos on the screen right now and a link to my Instagram if you want to drop me a follow over there. But that's it for me today and I hope to see you next time. Bye.